Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I want to attempt to fix this broken Amiga tank mouse that came with the early Revision 3 Amiga 500 I've been working on in previous videos. This is an early revision tank mouse that very likely shipped with the revision 3 Amiga 500 that I've been working on. And visually, we got it back to quite a nice condition after retro brighting and cleaning it. It's missing one glide pad, some other ones are a bit dislocated, but it doesn't fully work, unfortunately. I connected this up to my Amiga 600 for testing purposes and yeah, while up and down movement works smoothly, we barely get anything. It's like shaking a bit, the pointer is shaking a bit when I move this left or right. The buttons do work, right button shows me the menu bar and the left mouse button uh, opens things. So the buttons are all right. The only thing that's not really working correctly is left and right movement. I already did a video about fixing a completely broken 1351 mouse for the Commodore 64 that is very similar to the early Amiga tank mice actually internally. Basically they are very much the same except for the controller chip that's in the 1351 mouse that is needed to use some trickery that allows a proportional mouse to work on the C64 at all by using the pedal inputs on the SID chip. So yeah, let's take this apart and see what the trouble is. I think the troubleshooting should be very much the same as with the 1351 mouse. I already suspect something and I think the same uh, methods also apply to a number of other mice for other systems. The Atari ST mice are very much the same as the Amiga mouse, just with a slightly different pinout. And uh, for example, the early Macintosh mice are also very much the same, again with a different connector and a different pinout, but uh, same electronics basically. So some of what I am going to attempt is going to apply to those as well. The first thing I want to check is whether we get functionality from the infrared diodes and the phototransistors that are in here at all. I'm going to take this whole board out. Just going to set the case parts aside for a second. Yeah, and that's what's in here. There's this little daughter PCB that has the buttons, left and right mouse button on it, just wired up with the ground and two wires for the buttons. And the ball goes here. Usually we have these rollers made out of metal in this case, uh, which they change to plastic on later models, I think, to bring down the production cost probably. We have infrared diodes here and here and here and here, two for each direction. And we have these uh, discs with cutouts that are moved when you move the mouse. And there's actually light emitted through the slots in the discs and there's phototransistors on the other side that convert the light impulses to electrical signals that are then fed to this LM339 chip and then out to the Amiga basically. And there are some resistors, this row here in particular, that are for making up for production differences in the transistors. So these are basically biasing the transistors in a way so that we get logic levels that can be interpreted by the Amiga. And that's the thing I fixed for the 1351 mouse that I worked on previously. These transistors and the diodes, they all can kind of shift over the years and also the plastic might slightly deform so 
the levels that the transistors submit are maybe not going to be interpreted as logic high levels anymore. And you can usually fix that by replacing the resistors with different values that allow for the signal to reach logic high levels. And we're obviously talking TTL logic levels on a device of this vintage, uh, like late 80s, mid late 80s. So the values we are looking for, the voltages are 5 volts, slightly under 5 volts for logic high. And we're looking at close to 0 volts for a logical 0. So that's the levels we're aiming for. And usually what happens when I spin these disks, we should have 5 volts and 0 volts on these. And while the up and down movement works, that's this disk here, we need to find out the values of this disk here. And we're going to determine which resistors are connected to this. The first thing I'm going to do though is to see if everything is clean. I cleaned this already. I'm going to do some more cleaning on those diodes and uh, spray some compressed air into that to see if that already helps with more light shining through. And maybe that brings our levels to something that is interpretable by the Amiga. Yeah, I'm just going to clean these diodes. Like you can see little transparent casings here for the diodes. Let's try and use a Q-tip and some alcohol and clean these again. And also it is a good idea to see whether the diodes light up at all or not, which is doable with a camera, with a digital camera as we're going to see shortly. So these should be pretty clean. Uh, the discs also look relatively clean. I removed all the dust from this already. Uh, yeah, the electronics are probably what we're concerned with the most. Let's see if the LEDs light up at all. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs of all kinds. Recently they turned into kind of a one-stop solution for us tinkerers, uh, offering 3D printing services, sheet metal fabrication, CNC machining. The prices are super reasonable, delivery is fast, they are friendly people to work with, and I highly recommend checking out the link in the video description. Let's get back to our mouse. So I dimmed all the lights a bit and I've hooked this back up to the Amiga. And as you can see, these LEDs light up and these LEDs also light up, which is visible on camera. It very much depends on the camera you use. Some phone cameras, uh, the one on my phone also filters out infrared light, but my better camera, as you can see, shows this as a kind of a pink color here that is totally working. The LEDs are all right actually, so that's a good sign. They all seem to be the same or roughly the same luminance, so that's good. And this actually seems to behave a bit differently to the Commodore 64 mouse in that we don't have TTL logic levels on these resistors, but they are still connected to the outputs of the transistors, I think. So uh, we get levels from zero, which is the low, to uh, something like 0.4. The highest spots are around 0.4 volts over, measured just over this transistor, uh, resistor. <laughs> so let's go through these. The other, the next one should be for the other transistor on that uh, line. That's 2.2, okay, that's strange. Is that going to zero? No. Is that for the other direction? I think that might be for the other direction. So I'm just going to have to figure this out. Is this one the other one for this? Yeah, that's the other one, okay. The resistors behave a little bit differently than the Commodore 64 mouse resistors, but I still think they are connected to the phototransistors on here. So if I move the disk, this is for the uh, axis that wasn't working. 
we get values between 0.5 and 0 for this one. Okay, let's measure this one. So it's five resistors and this one seems to be always at the same level. It only changes ever so slightly. So this might be the positive uh, voltage supply, basically. And we need two resistors each for the axes. And this is at 2.2, that's not connected to this wheel and not connected to this wheel, it seems. It only changes ever so slightly. So it is different from the Commodore 64. I have determined some of those values and we have these two, the first one in the row and the third one for the Y and X axis respectively and they are changing between 0 and 0.4 or 0.5 volts uh, when I move the little discs. That is kind of strange. So up and down movement works fine. And the only one that is really off is this one, the fourth one in the row here, that gives me readings between 0 0.18 and 0 0.19 volts when I move it. So this one might be a bad resistor. I think this should be closer to this, 2.2 volts maybe. So maybe that's an idea to change that to something that gives me that voltage. Hmm, I'm not quite sure what to do here. But we can try to figure out a value for that one because this is the only one that's clearly off, I think. Can try to get a value for that. This last one seems to be always close to 5 volts, 4.5 volts, uh, no matter what I do with the discs. So that is probably uh, current limiting for the whole voltage supply through these. I think this has nothing to do with the directional movement. So uh, I think this one is the suspect. This one here, the fourth one. Yeah, and on the back of the board, you can see that these are my resistors here. And while the first couple go to different spots, the first four, the fifth one actually, uh, one side of them is all connected to ground. I believe this is ground. And the fifth one is separate, kind of. It is connected together with the fourth one, which is kind of strange. Okay. Goes through a whole bunch of other resistors there. So, uh, yeah, we should, should be able to desolder our resistor that behaved strangely. I'm, I'm just going to desolder the resistor and see if that changes anything. The fourth one in that row. There we go. That is resistor 2. And we should determine a value that is more suitable for this by just using a potentiometer, a adjustable resistor, to see if that changes the behavior. So I'm going to uh, put some wires in here and uh, add a potentiometer to that and see if we can determine a resistor value that works better for that. So I'm just wiring in a little uh, trimmer potentiometer like this, which is a 50k one, and maybe make this work again. I'm not quite sure if that's the issue. Maybe something's wrong with that transistor there, which would be bad, but yeah. Worth a try, I guess. Not much to lose on this mouse. Okay, looking at my probes to the variable resistor. So let's see what we get powering on the Amiga. And we get zero volts there. Let's see if we can find a high spot. So we want this to be two point, what was it? 2.2, something like that. Let's see if we get movement. Nope. We still get up and down movement, but we don't get anything for left and right. 
<clears throat> I don't think that's the problem. So we now have this at 2.1, the measurement we were aiming for, but I don't think that that is going to help with movement. So our left and right movement is still not working while our up and down movement is. So it's probably not that resistor. Hmm. So I put the original resistor back in and now we get the same values that we had again. Uh, 0.18 and 0.19 roughly volts over that transistor. Uh, resistor, I'm sorry, I keep confusing resistors and transistors for some reason today. Ha, ah, there's another row of uh, resistors here. That's also five. Maybe that's the ones that we need to look at. We should have logic levels somewhere. Let's try and figure that out. I'm just going to hook up my probes here. Yeah, that's more like it. We were looking at the wrong resistors, I think. <laughs> so this row might be the one. This is changing the horizontal position and that's 0.4 and 0. Yeah, this, this is probably more like it. These are the ones we're looking for. The ones on the bottom of the PCB here from this angle. So this is for the horizontal and that's between 0 and 4.5 volts. This should also be between 0 and 4.5. Yep. Yeah, these are the ones that are equivalent to the ones on the 1541. And this is also 0 and 4.5. This is also 0 and 4.5 for this direction. And 0 and 4.5 for this direction. Okay, let's try and figure these out. Maybe these are the ones. Yeah, so our left and right movement doesn't seem to do much on the output side of things. And it's probably not an issue with the resistors. There's just nothing coming from the transistors there probably. So let's check those. So now on the back side of the board, and this is the up and down. And that is, yeah, that's the transistors. And this one also seems to be okay. It's changing between for maybe we have a, a wiring problem after all so this seems to be all good actually these are the phototransistors they are roughly at 0.5 volts output the other side i think is connected to 5 volts and always the same they seem to work fine we just don't get an output there maybe we have a problem with our wire to the amiga the values that I get on the transistors, at least, are very much all right. Let's see what we get on our output, actually. These are our output wires, actually, on the mouse PCB. So let's see what we get there against ground. That's fluctuating between 4.7 and 0. That's all right. That's for our left and right. That is okay. This one is not fluctuating. It's fluctuating for the up and down. And that's okay. This is also for the up and down. And that's okay. So this one is okay. This one is okay. I think we have a wiring problem. So this one is left and right, and that's between 0 and 4.7. And this one is the other one for the output. And that's between 0 and 4.5, 4.7. So that should be totally considered logic high. Yeah, so we have a problem with our cable going to the Amiga, I guess. So the mouse might actually be okay. Was just following red herrings there because I thought I had that figured out. So the values we get on the output, which are the ones that matter, measured against ground, are totally okay. But we don't get them in the Amiga might have a broken wire in the cable. <laughs> yeah, this step should actually be the first uh, we check, but I rarely see any of those wires broken. Uh, so yeah, I used one of these uh, DE9 connectors, solder connector plugged into the mouse plug here, so we have it easier to test. And I'm just going to go through all these connections that go out of the mouse and see if we have continuity. On pin. I don't even know the pinout, but we should have all the pins on the connector, obviously. This one's here. This one's here. 
This one is not here <laughs> on none of the pins. Yeah, so we have our yellow wire broken. It's not going to the connector anywhere. That's the issue here, pretty sure. Yeah, so these are the connections that go actually go directly to the cable here. And the yellow wire, you can see here, doesn't make connection. So probably I'm going to desolder that, uh, strip a bit of this wire. Maybe it broke right on the circuit board. It's unlikely, but it might still be the case. So we're going to figure out if that helps. Yeah, I'm going to desolder this and try to measure the wire again after cutting the last bit there. It is uh, physically connected here, so I guess the break is somewhere in the cable and that's not going to be fixable in any easy manner. So probably it's a good idea to replace the cable. But uh, let me give this a shot first. So actually the, the electronics are all A-OK. -okay. It's just a broken cable, probably. That should be an easy fix. I can maybe salvage uh, original tank mouse cable from another tank mouse. I have several tank mice that I can use, which is a bummer because they are all working. But this is a special one because it's such an early model. We could just replace the whole mouse, obviously. I have probably have a working tank mouse that looks exactly the same. Probably not really worth salvaging a good mouse for this, but yeah. Maybe, maybe it is. It's a museum piece and this is about fixing stuff. You can still get like joystick cables and things like that to replace these. I'm just going to cut a bit of this and strip it and try to see if that makes connection to somewhere on the connector. No connection. Yeah, so the break is in the cable. That is not very good. So that's a broken cable. Ah, okay, sometimes it's the easiest things. I think otherwise this should be perfectly fine. It's just the cable. So I found in my stash of tank mice, I have about three of them. All of them seem to work fine. This is the one I like the least. It seems to be very bright. It's a very much newer model. It's from 392. It works fine. It has a different plug. Uh, the newer models had these straighter plugs compared to the original plug that uh, the tank mouse we're trying to fix comes with. Yeah, but this one is at least the cable seems to be good. So uh, probably it's a good idea to try and replace this cable. The one from the old mouse with this new cable. I'm not sure if this makes sense, but I'm just going to do it for the sake of fixing the original old tank mouse. This one also feels slightly sluggish. I don't know if uh, everything's all right in there. So let's see if the wiring is the same in this one and if we can just replace the same wire colors with the same. I guess it is. We're going to figure that out. Commodore was actually pretty consistent with the wire colors, I think. So chances are this is just going to be kind of a plug and play or solder and play replacement. <laughs> We're going to find out. Uh, they changed the whole design of these. Look at that. It's the cost reduced version, but it has proper tactile switches. Oh, and it has this connector. Okay, that's interesting and it has different wire colors. <laughs> so we're going to have to figure out the wiring of that, I guess. This is a pluggable connector in these, actually. That's pretty nice. And also the reason why this is uh, feeling kind of sluggish is that there's a lot of fluff in here. <laughs> it's electrically pretty much the same. It still has the 339 chip in there that we also have in here, LM339. And uh, plastic rollers, as you can see. The ball also is a different size, I think, slightly. Yeah, I think I want to determine the output and then solder on the new wire to the old mouse. Admittedly, not the ideal solution, but the solution that comes closest to what this mouse originally looked like, I think. So I, I guess we should do that. And just figure out the pinout. I guess this is the way. 
So I'm just going to take pictures of this pinout, which is a different one than the original one. So I continuity tested all the connections from both mouse PCBs to the connectors. And there's some good news. Actually, the pinout, the color coding on the pinout is the same except for the purple wire that is a gray wire on the more recent mouse model. But other than that, the colors all match up with the pinout. I wrote all these down, so it should just be a matter of cutting the wires uh, from this connector on the more modern mouse and soldering them onto the PCB of the older mouse. That's what I'm going to do. And actually the yellow wire is connected to pin 4 usually and that's one of the horizontal uh, signals. So uh, it makes sense that that just doesn't work on our old mouse. So let's transplant the cable. And that concludes my tutorial on making a wireless tank mouse that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, now desoldering all the wires from the old mouse. And uh, the color codes are labeled actually on the PCB, which makes this kind of an easy thing to do. This is just a single-sided PCB, so it's super easy to solder and desolder things. And there we go, that's that. And we want to remove the wires from here as well. And then after that, it's just going to be a matter of uh, putting the correct colors in the correct spots on this PCB. And I'm going to turn all the ends of the wires so we have it easier to solder them. Okay, that looks reasonable. And the connections on the top PCB which is blue for the left connector. And this sh should ideally still fit together. Up and down does still work. Left and right does work too. Okay, that's good. Right mouse button is, yeah, it's the correct one. Left mouse button works as well. Nice, okay, so this is technically working now. It was just a problem with the cable, indeed. So just cleaning the flux on my new solder joints here. And then I'm going to put it back into the case. That looks good. Nice, okay, let's put this back together. And then the last step is going to be uh, figuring out how to replace the glide pads. I already have a plan for that. That fits. Not going to replace the capacitors in this because frankly, it's not going to be necessary. Tank mouse back in operation. And it does look rather original except for the plug being slightly different, but yeah, I think that's that's okay. The cable was definitely broken and it's virtually impossible fixing one of these in a reasonable way without cutting it all apart and I don't know, that wouldn't look as good as this. And the electronics are actually all okay, which is kind of surprising, but that's how it is. <laughs> So for replacing the messed up glide pads, I'm just going to take the ball out of here. Could have done this while this was all apart, but uh, I want to remove the original glide pads. And actually there is another layer of plastic underneath that is quite glidey, 
but not as smooth as these were originally. They are a bit worn out. So I'm going to clean these. Uh, I'm going to remove these and clean this up. They're just stuck on. Super easy to remove at this point because the glue is super dry. Yeah, we're going to remove the remnants of the glue here. Everything we can get and then glue on some new stuff that I'm going to show you in a second. Which is not going to look super original, but it's going to work way better. So that's kind of a workaround for that. So we're going to remove everything here. The different layers of plastic that are on here. And we're going to remove the glue residue as well. There we go. I think alcohol and some uh, lighter fluids should do the trick and some Q-tip work as usual. Yeah, and it already clears up quite significantly. Yeah, I think we're pretty much good. Just cleaning up the remainder here. Yeah, it's a bit scratched, but we got rid of the glide pads, the original ones. So now this is very unglidey, obviously. But there's a way around that that I'm going to try for the first time today. You can buy replacement glide pads for all kinds of mice that are pre-cut for the mouse model especially for gaming mice and things like that. You can also just buy sheets of this. And this is a sheet of black glide pad material. This is very, I think it's Teflon or something, so it's really uh, glidey. Probably way better than the stuff that was here before. And we got some cleaning wipes, which are probably just alcohol wipes. And I'm going to cut these uh, to size with a hole punch. I think that might work well. We're going to try that. As I said, this is the first time for me. And I think we need to go with the largest hole punch I have, which is 12 millimeters. And that, yeah, that's exactly the size we need. So yeah, uh, let's try and punch some holes into this. Hope this works. Okay, that one looks good. Also looks good. Maybe it's even 11 millimeters. Let's try one with 11 if that fits better. We're going to go with 11 millimeters. So the 11 millimeters actually is the correct size. So we need uh, 11 millimeters for all of these, which is what I'm going to do. We already have one, we need three more. 11 millimeter hole punch. I'm going to use one of these wet wipes, which is just actually an alcohol covered wipe. It smells exactly like the isopropyl I used to clean this previously, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. I'm just clean, clean my hands a bit. And we should be able to apply these. And they won't look quite original because they are black instead of uh, transparent or white or beige as the originals, but this is hop hopefully going to work nicely. Yeah, and 11 millimeters is definitely the exact correct size for these. There's a bit of a protective layer on there that we have to remove after applying them. This is probably going to end up being the smoothest traveling uh, tank mouse ever. Oh, and I already removed the protective film from that one, <laughs> accidentally. Yeah, so removing the protective film, which literally just more or less wipes off. Doesn't look too bad to me. Oh, and it feels smooth. Okay, uh, just cleaning the ball up again. I also gave the cable another wipe and we're actually getting somewhere probably going to do some more cleanup on that off camera but the dirt actually comes off with some persuasion 
and it feels super smooth. <laughs> kind of a turbocharged tank nose. That feels pretty good actually. Yeah, let's see whether this actually still works on the Amiga. Yay, and it still works. And it feels very nice. Feels better than any tank mouse ever. <laughs> cool. So uh, definitely recommend these glide pads, which fit fine and work perfectly well. Yeah, that is one supercharged tank mouse and it totally works. Sorry for my going down the rabbit hole in the completely wrong direction. Wasn't prepared for something as easy as replacing the cable. But uh, hopefully it was still an informative and entertaining video. These are not scripted. It's impossible to script repairs like this, obviously. So, hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and on Ko-fi. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for your thumbs and your comments and also for your subscriptions. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. Thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye.